Okay, so good morning, everyone. And first of all, I would like to thank the conveners for inviting me to come to the beautiful Yosemite Park and give this presentation. Um, I will talk about some uh, recent work that uh, uh, we did about the observation and the modeling study of uh, storm enhanced density. Um, as John uh, gave a great talk on Monday, that uh, the storm enhanced density, or SCD, is really one of the prominent features that's observed in the mid-latitude or sub aurora region uh, during geomagnetic storms. Like uh, this is a two-dimensional GPS TC distribution. Here is the GPS TC uh, density enhancement, or SCD, and uh, the SCD plumes extending to higher latitude. Occasionally, they can cross the open closed field line boundary and uh, um, get into the polar cap and start to supply the high density dayside plasma to the polar cap and the nightside aurora zone. However, the, uh, the um, formation mechanism for the SCD is still an open question. So when we think about uh, density enhancement in the ionosphere, either the densities are created locally or they can be transported somewhere. Um, for example, they can be transported from lower latitudes, such as predicted by the equatorial superfontan effect, or they can be transported horizontally due to high-speed flows like the sub polarization streams. As for the more local um, mechanism, it can be due to the energetic particle precipitation, can be due to both electrons and protons, or there is a, a O over N2 ratio um, increase, so we have a higher production here that can also increase the density. And uh, the, another mechanism for the local increase is the local imbalance between the production and the loss due to vertical lifting of the plasmas to lower recombination rate. This lift can be due to uh, the equal speed drift projected onto the vertical uh, direction, or it can be due to the uh, equatorial thermospheric wind, which drags the plasmas to higher um, altitude. So unlike many other phenomena, it's very possible that for one SCD um, uh, formation, uh, multiple mechanisms can operate at the same time. So it's important to find for a specific storm with, or for um, a class of storms, which mechanism is the dominant one for the density increase. Okay, so the first part of this talk is observations. And this is recently published in JGR in December last year. Um, we use um, the two-dimensional GPS TEC and the um, convection flow observations from Superdance to look at the large scale um, TEC variation and uh, the um, convection pattern. For more localized observations, we use uh, the advanced modular scanner radar located um, at Poker Flat or the FIDER radar um, here. And, uh, um, and the FIDER radar um, has a fully electronic steering capability. So basically, <coughs> it can look at uh, different directions in the ionosphere almost simultaneously. And then we can resolve those uh, important, for example, the um, three-dimensional ionosphere vectors, uh, vectors um, at a very high um, temporal resolution. This is especially important for us to look at highly dynamic electromagnetic um, uh, um, uh, variations in the aurora zone. Okay, so I concentrate on a storm occurred on October 24, 25th. 2011. This is a, a two-day IMF observation. Um, and this storm is uh, induced by uh, CME, and the DST minimum reached about 100 minus 30 nanotesla. It's not a super storm, but it's a decent-sized storm. Um, from the top to the bottom, I'm showing the uh, IMF BX, um, BYBZ component and the dynamic pressure. So there are three important time cadence uh, to remember. The first one is uh, when the dynamic pr pressure hit the magnetosphere, and we have the stormy uh, sudden commencement here. After that, the IMF started to fluctuate, and then um, until 22 UT, the um, IMF became uh, relatively steady and strongly southward. Uh, several hours later, the IMF BZ turned back to above zero, and the, at this time, the IMF BY is about 20 nanotesla, so it's huge and very steady. So it's very uh, interesting. 
Um, this is a two-dimensional GPS TC and Superdown observations at selected time cadence during this storm. That, um, each panel is uh, a polar view of the GPS TC, and uh, noon is at the top, dusk is on the on side. Um, this first panel is just before the storm, and right after the sudden commencement, we start to see the GPS TC increase over our North America. And this uh, density enhancement seemed to uh, extend uh, further equatorward. So it's uh, not very likely that uh, the super fountain effect um, is uh, um, the contributing mechanism for this density increase here. And after the southward turning, we start to see the polar cap convection pattern um, become much larger and extending to the equator region. And uh, at the same time, the, uh, stormy, the density continues to increase at uh, um, the sub region here. And later in the storm, we see that the SCD polar boundaries and the convection patterns equator um, boundary uh, align with each other very well. And here is a, a tiny plume formed over Alaska in this case. It's also very interesting to point out that um, because of the strong IMFBY in this case, um, the mid latitude trough extended all the way from the midnight and to the, uh, almost the noon sector here. Okay, before I show you the feather observations, uh, I'd like to talk about the beam configuration for this experiment. Um, it's a four beam configuration. We have one beam located at the lowest latitude looking along the magnetic field. The beam in the center is pointing vertically in geographic coordinates, and there are two more beams looking at a higher latitude, one tilted towards the west and one tilted towards the east. <coughs> okay, so here is a summary plot of the feather observation. Uh, the left plot is for the storm day, and the right plot is uh, uh, what the feather would normally observe during a quiet day. So I just want to give you um, an impression of how dynamic the ionosphere is during storm time. And then we can uh, zoom in to the storm time feather observation. The top three panels are the convection flow direction, the magnitude, and the vector representation. The bottom two plots are the electron density measured by a beam at a higher latitude and the beam at the lowest latitude along the magnetic field. Um, before the storm um, uh, occurred, the convection flow uh, magnitudes are very uh, small, just like the choir day. And until um, um, after the uh, sudden commencement, we start to see some lifting of the F region plasma to higher latitude, to higher altitude. And then uh, what I call SCD part one here is the right after the southward turning. And we start to see uh, we, uh, weak northward convection flows, green means northward, and the magnitude are a few hundred meters per second. You cannot see very clearly here. Um, the F region plasmas are significantly enhanced during this period. And uh, there is uh, another um, part, which I call SCD part two, the convection flows are totally different. They are dominated by those um, extremely large two or three thousand uh, meter per second on northwestward convection flows. And uh, interestingly, the beam at higher latitude observed a density decrease, while the beam at the lowest latitude observed a further uh, increase of the F region density. This is some vertical profiles uh, within the two SCD. Um, uh, this is the, the beam at lowest latitude, and this is the beam uh, at the higher latitude. The black curves in all the panels represent the quiet time um, profile, and the blue curves are for storm time. So you can see that during the, uh, within the SCD, the plasma are lifted to the top side of the ionosphere, and the density is increased significantly there. But in the lower F region, their densities uh, uh, are reduced. Um, in the later stage, the SED part two, um, the beam two at the lowest latitude observed um, uh, a huge uh, F, uh, NMF2 increase 
the peak density almost tripled what is observed uh, during the choir time, while the one at higher latitude is in the uh, mid-latitude trough. So no surprise that uh, the density is much lower. Um, this is the electron and ion temperature vertical profile observed by uh, the FIDER. Uh, this is the top two panels are the electron temperature, the bottom two are the ion temperature. This one is for SED1, and this column is for SED2. So it's interesting to see that during storm times, the electron temperatures in the lower F region uh, increase, and while in the, um, uh, in the upper F region, it decreased. This is because if we don't have additional heat stores, the reduced electron density in the lower F region can increase the energy of uh, um, uh, energy um, for each um, electrons, and it's opposite uh, in the upper um, F region there. Um, during SED2, where we observed the extremely large uh, northward convection flows, uh, we see the electron temperature increased significantly. In the upper F region, it reached about 6,000 um, Kelvin. Imagine that if we have uh, uh, 1,600 um, uh, all sky imagers there. This is the region where we will see uh, the star arcs. OK. With uh, the full beam configuration, uh, we can use the FIDO observations to calculate the three-dimensional ion velocities. Um, and uh, use the, the equal speed drift, uh, we can calculate the vertical uh, velocity um, due to the equal speed drift. And also, we can calculate the projection of the anti-parallel component along the vertical direction. And then we can sum them up to, together to get the total um, vertical velocity, which is the red curve here. And I also superpose the, the magenta curve. This is the vertical velocity measured by uh, beam one. Remember, this is the one in the center. Then it measured directly in the vertical direction. So they agree with each other very well. What this plot tells us is that during the first SCD, there is, uh, the vertical flows reach the, a few uh, tens meters per second. And this is um, almost 100% due to the projection of the equal speed drift. And during the second part of the SCD, the vertical flows reached a couple of hundred meters per second. It's huge. And uh, about 80% of this uh, um, vertical flow is due to the equal speed drift projection, and another 20% due to the um, anti-parallel component, or the equator thermospheric wind. OK, the next the question is, uh, what is uh, the source of this electric field, or where it maps to in the magnetosphere? Um, one way is we can look at the associated um, energetic particle precipitations, and also the field line current polarity. Um, the plot on the left are the pose uh, satellite observation of the energetic particle um, precipitating flux is dominated by um, KeV um, protons. And uh, the energy flux from the protons is about 90% um, in this case. And uh, the plot on the right shows uh, the fuel line currents from the ampere on um, iridium satellites. This is where the uh, FIDER radar is located. And we can see it's uh, co-located with a downward, uh, region, uh, downward region 2 fuel line current. And we further did a uh, simulation run. Um, we use the best RS coupled with the CRCM model. Um, and uh, then we um, find the center of this uh, downward region 2 field line current here. And then uh, trace the field lines, map them to the equatorial plane. And we can see, indeed, the map to the inner edge of this ring current. And uh, this is consistent with uh, these two observations, that the large northwestward flows are uh, the uh, suborbital polarization streams. Remember that the post-satellite observed energetic part um, proton precipitation is actually also very obvious in the electron density measurement um, by FIDER. And uh, those energetic protons are very efficient in ionizing the E region. So we can see the peak here and also here. And uh, using the density peak uh, in the E region, we can do a very rough estimate that um, 
the contribution of the precipitation protons to the F region uh, density peak cannot exceed 10%. Uh, um, and this is a, a very generous estimation. Okay. Um, Feather is located as a region that uh, where this kind of plumes can usually occur due to the mismatch between the uh, magnetic dipole um, and the um, rotational dipole. So we have many storm cases like this, and uh, um, they repeat. Um, we repeatedly see those density enhancement, uh, like what I have described uh, described in the October storm. So the second part I will talk about the modeling. Afrasian plasmas have a long lifetime. They remember their past. So we have to use uh, numeric models to study the transport effect. Um, so I used the global ionosphere thermosphere model developed by one of my co-authors, uh, Aaron Ridley. The GITM solves for the major ion and neutral species in the ionosphere. And then um, they solve the neutral wind, um, ion and the electron velocities. They can also provide the, um, their temperatures. And the unique um, feature about GITM is that uh, it can have a non-hydrostatic solution, and it solves in the altitude coordinates. Uh, in our simulation, our uh, simulation regime is from 95 kilometers to about 700 uh, kilometers, and also the horizontal grade size is about 1 degree in uh, latitude and 3.3 degrees in longitude. The simple Okay, the simple comparison that we can do is I can calculate the modeled um, TEC at the farther location and compare it with uh, uh, the observations. So we can see that um, the GITM can uh, uh, produce a TEC enhancement um, at the farther side, but the magnitude is uh, much smaller than that observed by GPS TEC. And uh, one of the reasons is that um, the uh, TEC calculation in GITM uh, is from 98 kilometers to about 650 kilometers only. So we ignored the part, um, the top side on the sphere further up, and also the plasma sphere um, contribution. Um, what I can do also is uh, when the um, peak TEC is observed at the, the um, fiber, I can select uh, um, several points in the near the fiber observation site, and I ask the question, where do they come from? And then I can trace the particles backwards in time. This uh, is what those uh, particles are. Um, two hours earlier, they can f um, come from very different latitude and very different local time. Well, I have to mention that this is now in the geographic coordinates, and everything in GITAM is in geographic coordinates. Um, and then I can look at the TEC variations along the trajectories. This is the time goes backwards. Um, this is the ending point and uh, two hours earlier. So from this, we can see that particles uh, at a very different start from very different local times can have very different uh, TEC variations along their journey. For example, the one coming from the morning sector, it um, observed it shows steady TEC increase, um, about 10 TEC unit increase within two hours. The one from the middle somewhere near noon has the highest TEC value and uh, only a couple of TEC uh, unit increase. The one from the dusk side shows the largest variations. And uh, it's interesting to see um, why. Um, before we look at uh, um, that. We can also look at uh, the um, NMF2 and the HMF2 variations along those uh, three trajectories. Again, uh, this left column is the morning sector. This is uh, um, the starting point near noon. And uh, the right um, hand side is the starting point in the afternoon sector. The top panel is the TEC variation, and we have seen before. The middle panel is the NMF2. The bottom one is the HMF2. So compare the uh, characteristics um, between those points from the morning sector and the afternoon sector. We can see that they have uh, um, started from, the, the one from the morning sector started from the lowest uh, NMF2 and gradually increases. 
the HMF to increase about 50 kilometers within these two years, uh, within these two hours. And this is also the smallest uh, lifting that we see among those three. Um, the one from the afternoon sector um, showed some uh, decrease in the NMF2, but also, uh, the HMF2 can increase 100 kilometers within half an hour. And because I'm running out of time, this is the last slide I will show. Um, I go back and I look at the convection pattern during this time where we observed the TC increase for the um, plasma coming from the dusk side. And this is also the time where the HMF2 increased about 100 kilometers. Um, these two plots are the convection patterns um, during this, uh, uh, at the beginning of this time here and at the end of the time here. You can see the convection pattern extended um, equator uh, a lot and start to get into the high density daylight plasma region. And if I compare the density vertical profiles um, for those two time cadence, you can see that top side uh, electron density increased significantly. And uh, in GITAM, we can also uh, save the density change uh, due to uh, the chemistry or the vertical or the horizontal transport uh, at uh, 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 every step. So in this case, we can see this is uh, one of these uh, um, density changes, but it's very representative. We can see that uh, the top side density increase is mainly due to the vertical lifting here. Okay, so let me go back to my conclusion. So I talk about some um, multi-instrument observations and the preliminary modeling results of a storming enhanced density during the October 24, 25, 2011 uh, storm. Um, the SCD observed by Feather can be divided into two parts because they have very different characteristics in their electron density, their NMF2, and also the convection flows. And uh, um, the first part of the SCD is likely due to the penetration of the eastward electric field and the projection of the northward convection flows in the vertical direction. The second part um, is more complicated. We observed the very large vertical flows, 80% due to electric field, 20% due to equatorial thermospheric wind. Um, we think that those large westward flows are the suborbital polarization streams. Um, the energetic particle precipitation also contributes to the SCD part two density increase but plays a very minor role. We also um, talk about some GITAM simulation results uh, we did recently. The TC enhancement near FIDER can be reproduced, but the magnitude uh, is smaller. Um, and uh, also we traced the, the particles backwards and we find that although the TC um, values are nearly the same around FIDER, but the plasmas um, in the uh, nearby simulation grid points came from very different latitudes and the local time, and they have very different characteristics in terms of their HMF2 and the NMF2. Okay, that's it. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Uh, John? While that's going over there, maybe I can just quickly ask. Uh, your last point there about um, the high density coming from low latitudes, um, Jan Soika and others at Utah State have been looking at that and, and uh, determining that quite a bit of the high latitude density is actually produced locally or at least on the path and not actually transported fully from low latitudes. Have you looked at the source and loss along the Yeah, path? Okay. yeah. Maybe I missed that. I didn't have time to talk about the details, but uh, for example, this plot is uh, on the left is the instantaneous, uh, you know, density change due to chemistry, vertical lifting, or the um, horizontal transport. And it is transport, not local. Sort is that your conclusion, or maybe um, I don't understand that plot. So we are tracing the plasma column backwards in time. So, in principle, I should not have the plasma coming in and out from this plasma. In the horizontally, but we are going backwards in time. So we see um, along how 
Let me rephrase this. As within, the plasma is coming from the low latitude, yeah. there is local um, mechanism mm -hmm. increase the density. Uh, Sasha, that's a, a really excellent talk. It's uh, great to see all the observations from <coughs> Pfizer. Since your talk follows Bob Shunk's talk, and he talked a little bit about us all being back at Utah State, I want to make a little comment. And since Joe Dupnick's here, Joe and I took observations with the ancient Chattanooga radar up, up where Pfizer is, and we saw plumes of ionization, which were really SED plumes, going through the cusp. And I remember I showed these to Bob Shunk, and the real characteristic was the F region peak was raised up above 500 um, um, kilometers in <laughs> altitude. Bob looked at these with his model and he says, John, the model doesn't show this. The real, the real answer to what's going on is that you've got a broken radar there. So <laughs> be careful. Yeah. Um, thank you, John, for comment that. I actually want to um, comment on this point is about the different characteristics of the plasmas observed around Pfizer. For example, from the simulation, we can see if the plasma is coming from the dusk side, it has a much higher um, H HMF2. And if uh, they are coming from the dawn side, although the TEC values are roughly the same, but their um, peak height is much lower. So this maybe can give us some clue that uh, you know, in our radar observations, those uh, um, particles with different characteristics may originate from different um, convection cells. So, Sasha, very nice talk. Perhaps I missed this, but what was your explanation for the high electron temperatures in the second part of the Pfizer observations? Are they direct heating by precipitation? I didn't really explain that in this talk because of uh, limited time, but since you asked, I think um, it has uh, the contribution from the ring current. Um, so there is a phenomenon called storm time electron enhancement, uh, electron temperature enhancement, so I think it's uh, because of ring current energetic particles it interact with the cold plasma uh, sphere electrons and heat those electrons. And those electrons can, you know, uh, due to high thermal conductivity, they can increase the electrons at a lower um, uh, altitude. So I think so the, the heat, heat is coming is from on the, ring the ring current. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, so I wonder if you could just uh, clarify for me. So um, during the storm, it looked like um, the density at uh, lower and middle latitudes on the day side was enhanced over what you normally see, uh, almost everywhere. Uh -huh. uh, and then um, there was some projections or changes in the shape of that density enhancement, one of which you picked out and sort of said, okay, that's a set. Um, is that, am I interpreting that right? That's my first question. The second question is, in your mechanisms for producing a, uh, an SED, you had um, uh, horizontal transport, vertical transport, and chemistry, um, and I'm not quite sure how to distinguish those. Um, so you can change the density with a divergence of a horizontal flux or by changing the net production and loss. Is there a third process that I don't know about? Um, okay, so um, first the question you ask, the, how do I know whether those uh, enhancements are related with the SCD? Is that what your question? No, I just um, the, the, uh, the density, the, the densities are enhanced everywhere on the day side. And so uh, the SCD is a, was a, a particular feature in that enhanced density that you picked out. Um, See, so it, it goes from green there to seen, all this red everywhere. <laughs> yeah, this is the SCD, right? Yeah, and uh, the two density uh, increase observed by the radars is, of course, only a very small part of that SCD that we see from the two-dimensional GPS TC maps. Okay, we should take it offline. Uh -huh. 